and welcome to a special interview focusing on local projects involving automated vehicles. I'm Tabitha Coulter, Director of Operations for PAVE, and I'm thrilled to introduce two special guests today. We're going to be discussing autonomous vehicle technology being used in Jacksonville, Florida with Michael Feldman and Bill Frazier. Mike is the director of Jacksonville's U2C program and Bill Fraser is the director of automation and quality assurance with JTA, the Jacksonville Transportation Authority. JTA is an independent state agency serving the area through a number of mass transit services and creating an integrated transportation network. They've been doing some great innovative work with automated vehicles and we're lucky to have them also sitting on our paid public sector advisory council. Mike and Bill, thanks for joining us for this conversation. Thank you, Tabitha, happy to be here. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Um, Mike, I was hoping to start off with you and have you introduce us to the mobility innovation scene in Jacksonville, especially with autonomy, automated vehicles. Yeah, no, most definitely. So again, thank you for having us on, on today. And uh, we'd love to share some of our experience in the autonomous space. Uh, so again, my name is Mike Feldman. I work in the Automation and Innovation Division with Bill here at the Jacksonville Transportation Authority. And I think you hit the nail on the head, Tabitha. We are doing some super exciting um, things here, and not only in the autonomous vehicle space, but also in the connected vehicle space, uh, to which my colleague Bill will discuss a little bit further. But let's talk about the ultimate urban circulator for a second, right? Um, so what, what exactly is the ultimate urban circulator? Really, it's this really innovative and disruptive approach to injecting technology into somewhat of a complicated transit ecosystem. So what does that all mean, right? So we are looking not only at autonomous vehicles, but we are also looking at both the physical and digital ecosystem that allows autonomous vehicles to operate both safely and efficiently. So let's go back to this ultimate urban circulator concept. This is really a 10 mile fully autonomous system where we'll inject not only vehicles, but also that ecosystem I mentioned. And it really has three major phases. So think of these as individual projects, buckets, very, very, very important um, 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 projects. Phase one is the Bay Street Innovation Corridor. And that's really the first phase of the ultimate urban circulator vision uh, of this vision. And that, that, that particular project involves not only introducing the fleet, but also the digital ecosystem, but this is specifically in a fixed route kind of capacity. So this will be an at grade solution. It'll have three loops, west, middle, and an east loop. And we will really connect folks downtown, um, not only from the west side of Jacksonville, but also servicing the growing Jaguar sports complex. So super exciting phase there. Um, that phase is fully funded and, and really actively in a procurement as we speak today. So we're super excited about phase one. Phase two is equally as important, I would say equally as exciting as well, is we currently operate an automated people mover, uh, similar to what you would find in an airport environment um, that moves folks in between terminals. Well, we have a system that's been in place for over 30 years that really services the north and the south bank of Jacksonville. We've got eight stations, 10 trains, two and a half miles of bi-directional elevated Skyway infrastructure. Well, a few years ago, uh, a, a really a group of professionals and key stakeholders within the city, Department of Transportation, the board, uh, and then the JTA, of course, came together and said, hey, we have this aging infrastructure. What do we do, right? Do we, do we buy and invest in new trains? Do we tear it down and demolish it? And then what does the community also want us to do? And really it was determined that we want to leverage that existing infrastructure, but in a different capacity. And that different capacity then became really the U2C was born um, in introducing disruptive technology and autonomous vehicles, of course, at an elevated guideway, really turning that into a roadway at elevation for autonomous vehicles. So phase one gets us at the elevator or that the uh, fixed uh, route solution. Phase two does a conversion of the superstructure of the existing Skyway today into a roadway at elevation to which we will also connect the at-grade solution and the elevated solution via connection points to create connectivity, right? And then that third phase or that third bucket, as I mentioned under the U2C program is how do we get outside of the urban core of Jacksonville and service other communities and neighborhood and create really this nexus of connectivity. So if you can't tell, we're super, super excited uh, and we're working on a very, very cool and passionate project here in downtown Jacksonville. That's really neat to learn about. Um, Bill, I was hoping you could talk to us a little bit about JTA's role in the region and some of the services that you're currently offering and maybe a little bit on how AV technologies fit into that mission. Uh, sure thing, Tabitha, and that's a great question. Um, besides just offering transit services, JTA is responsible for building out the roads and the bridges in the area and then hands, those response, and then hands that responsibility over, over to FDOT. But with that, kind of what Mike was talking about, we can integrate what uh, what we want into those projects as far as the connected infrastructure. 
What we offer now is a, a bus service uh, for the region. Jacksonville is a large city uh, land wise, so there's a large stretch. So not only buses, BRT uh, lines connecting the, uh, the major thoroughfares of the city, there's also the, uh, the, the select services that Mike rides in the morning from uh, example, St. John's County up to JRTC. It's a luxury service. Uh, they're nice, uh, you know, they're nice buses, uh, they're the smaller buses, they have leather seats and Wi-Fi. So really innovative types of approaches of moving people around as well as smaller uh, services around the city, uh, you know, things like that. And then where the AVs play a role is to connect a lot of these last mile services around downtown that Mike was just talking about. And AVs, we see as being an innovation into the transit sector. Uh, it provides a safe environment. It provides a new type of transportation uh, that we can, you know, that we can act, that multiple people can access. We can provide services to even more people with these types of smaller vehicles that maybe a 40 foot bus may not be able to, uh, to facilitate. Uh, they'll all be ADA compliant. Uh, we want to make sure that anyone in the city is able to ride on these vehicles. And really, that's the mission of the JTA is to provide transportation services to anyone within our reach. And this is just one more way to start connecting more and more people. And this is just the beginning, uh, the phases that Mike was talking about. We feel that the AVs can really branch out and get into neighborhoods and other areas to service those that may not have access right now. So it, it's really, you know, sky's the limit. There's, there's really no end in sight to, to the different services we can provide. And this is just one more service uh, that we can provide. And as we, uh, you know, as we're here in a year, going on a year anniversary of the JRTC, our new regional hub, uh, that was a move to try to connect more people. Uh, we're looking at different ways of connecting different parts of the city, but with the JRTC and this new hub, it's providing us more opportunity being that it's, the, it's a stop on the Skyway currently, which is what Mike spoke about, which will be a stop on the U2C program for the AVs. So there's been a long uh, thought process and how to better connect the city. And really that's what it's all about. That's the really real service that the JT provides is connecting people with places. So the AVs are just one more extension to that program. Absolutely. And, you know, when you think about connecting those communities and, and serving the public, like you're discussing, you know, obviously outreach to the public is an important piece of that. Um, Mike, I know that the Ultimate Urban Circulator Program has conducted a, a number of outreach, public meetings, public engagement surveys, and more. Um, have you found that the different outreach activities have uh, various pros and cons when it comes to engaging with the public? Yeah, I think I think to say the least, right? Um, so we take public outreach kind of really on the forefront of what we do, especially when it comes to socializing this technology that not only is it quite disruptive, it's very new, right? Um, so we kind of lean forward in the foxhole, if you will, and ensuring that we maintain connectivity to the community, not only the community in general, those future riders, but also the key stakeholders that are involved in helping us push the message that this is safe and efficient transportation. Uh, that will essentially become, you know, a force multiplier as we continue to integrate disruptive technology into public transportation. So that's my first point. I think my second point is the approach to outreach um, has to be somewhat strategic, right? Keeping not only the community and those riders in mind, but we also have to keep other partners such as our first responder community. Um, we attended a conference and, and I want to say it was in Orlando a few years ago. One of the major feedbacks that we heard from the first responder community is really integrating them into the strategic footprint, not only from an outreach perspective, but integration into how to handle the technology, right? How does a police officer or first responder approach a vehicle that doesn't have a driver in it, right? So there are some very complex problems and that being obviously a, a very rudimentary one, but very important. Um, so we've launched a first responder council as a result. I think we're a year plus into that first responder council of, of pushing that outreach and involving them in our processes, both strategically uh, to ensure that we're successful in deploying that technology within the urban core. Um, so that's one element. Two, Bill mentioned a very important point, something that's very, very important to us at the JTA. We are in the business of providing safe and efficient transportation that is accessible by all, right? And under that pretense, we, we take a very, I got another leaning forward approach with interacting with our, our community of the disabled folks, right? So we also participate in what's called a JTAC um, group, 
which has folks with, with different, you know, uh, a variety of different um, impairments. Um, and we integrate them into everything that we do. We've integrated them into test and learn. We've integrated them in our strategic footprint as we deploy new technology. Um, so their feedback bar none has been somewhat, you know, has been, I should say invaluable, right? Um, to this point, as a matter of fact, I met with them, them today. So very, very important that from an outreach perspective, right? We involve all different uh, types of people because understanding that our core mission really is to provide transportation for all. And that's what we'll continue to do. Mm -hmm. And I heard, Mike, I heard you mention the AV test and learn track, which, uh, Bill, I would love to have you explain that a little bit more. I know that was a project, uh, one of the ones I first heard about in terms of Jacksonville, and I would love to have you explain how that kind of fits into this uh, project portfolio you guys are working on. Uh, yeah, and man, that's a smooth segue, because to elaborate on the outreach program uh, that Mike just spoke about, we, we want to make sure that anyone has access to our facility. Uh, to, this, to this technology. So we provide tours. Uh, we have public meetings uh, there. Uh, as, Mike, as Mike mentioned, we had a member of our JTAC community come to a public meeting uh, that was at the uh, Armsdale Test and Learn facility. We've had council members uh, tour our facility. Uh, we've had community groups come to our facility. We've had summer camps. We've had school groups. Uh, and so we take the vehicles wherever we can, whenever we can. So the test and learn facility plays an integral role in that. And when we're not doing uh, summer camps and you know having fun, we're having fun other ways. We always have fun out there is really what it comes down to. And we, we have a variety of different vehicles and technologies. We currently have a fleet of three autonomous vehicles. And we've mocked up a cityscape out there at the test and learn facility. We've got a connected uh, traffic signal. We've got a, a pedestrian crossing with sensors and an RSU for connectivity. Uh, we have a roundabout, which you'll also find a roundabout on the Bay Street Innovation Corridor. Uh, so we try to, to mimic as much as we can out on our test track, provide information. And what we're doing is we're testing how the vehicle would operate within our operational design domain. So based on the various ODDs that we would experience, we can, we can test for that. Uh, we've also just recently implemented a connected infrastructure uh, traffic signal inside the facility because we've had requests and we want to investigate operating these vehicles inside where you may not get uh, GPS connections. So you have to rely on other sensors and other type of technologies. So we're exploring that. We also have a wonderful partnership with FSCJ, our local college, and we're able to use their uh, CDL test track uh, for larger types of test, test campaigns. It's a one mile loop and that provides a whole different set of testing scenarios that we can do. Uh, we're in the process of getting some, uh, some mobile uh, traffic signals uh, delivered that are connected. They have RSU, sensors, LIDAR, everything you would find on a regular infrastructure uh, downtown that we can mock up intersections out there uh, in, in different ways that we can experiment. And so we wanna see how it works within our, within our region, you know, as Mike was talking before, it's 10 miles, there's a lot of different environments that we come across. So the test and learn is a way to explore. Uh, it's a way to, you know, investigate and understand how these vehicles operate. And also, it's a great opportunity to just let people within the JTA know what's going on, because this is new. Uh, you know, we can, we, we live in, we live and breathe this every day, but not everyone else does. We, we host a lot of people out at our facility, in, internal and external stakeholders that, that may learn about what we're doing and provide examples and ask questions. And so we, we, we have them fill out surveys to understand their thoughts. We just had an internship program come through and it was great to hear their point of view as the younger generation and where they're looking at going for transportation in the future. So there's a lot of different aspects uh, that the test and learn facility uh, addresses, not just testing the vehicle and how it operates. So it's a, it, it, I think you'll see this from anything we do. It's a very holistic approach. It's not just here we test the vehicle. It's okay, we test the vehicle, but we want to make sure that everyone can access it and how is it going to operate on the streets? And then what are people going to think about it? Are they going to feel safe on it? So we try to collect as much data as we can. We try to be as objective as possible. But also there's a lot of subjectivity to it. Do you like the way it looks? Do you like the way it feels? Do you like the way it smells? How does it, you know, what are the sounds you're hearing? So we try to capture all that and really understand what 
implementing these vehicles downtown means. That's a quick overview on what we do at, uh, at Armsdale. No, that's great. And, you know, as you're talking about serving kind of all those different audiences and having them mm -hmm. interact with um, both of the programs that you guys are discussing. Um, that's something, you know, at PAVE, we're really passionate about trying to educate different audiences mm -hmm. about this technology, people who are coming in with different levels. So I'd love to hear any insights you guys could share about how you've learned to kind of communicate the information about the AV technology to different audiences, whether that's the kids at summer camp or policymakers who come through. Um, I'd love to have you guys touch on, on that element. Sure. Yeah, I'll take a, a first stab at that, Bill. So um, Bill mentioned something that's also very important to us. And I, and I think I think we have been very aggressive in this space that we've done a couple of things. First, um, we have a very strong partnership with the Duval County Public School System. Um, we're actually in an effort underway just to show the importance on that effort is to we're creating kind of a mobile STEM bus, if you will, to bring STEM activities to underserved communities that typically wouldn't have access to STEM. Um, First and foremost. Second of all, um, Bill mentioned that who would have thought, I guess, summer camps would be so popular. Um, we hosted so many summer camps to the Test and Learn facility. We invite you and anyone else that listens to this uh, um, recording to, to, to come participate because Bill and the team have done some really remarkable things out there at the Test and Learn site. But I say that to say is we've got to be able to communicate at all types of levels because um, People are not speaking, you know, the same language when it comes to technology, right? And that's because they don't live it and breathe it, as Bill mentioned, like we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but I think one thing that we continue to remind ourselves is that we we have this responsibility, right, to provide a technology and a service to the community. And we've also, in certain, need to be able to articulate that in a way that they understand what we're doing, right, at all levels. Um, so we have spoken uh, to elementary schools, and I love to share this story. Um, when you when you ask this question, I have this immediate reminder of, of when Bill and I and the team, we, we, we said before we start trying to figure out how we're going to convey very complicated technology or technical information as such as a LIDAR sensor to someone that's eight, we've got to do a trial ton of pre, you know, and pressure test this. Um, so we decided to bring our families and our kids out to the test and learn site and pressure test that to see how that worked. Come to find out they were really interested in the Chick-fil-A. Um, that we provided for lunch. But really, and, and you know, all funniness aside, we figured out really quick how difficult it is to convey very complex information um, to the folks that are going to be the future of this technology, right? The legacy that we're going to leave behind will be these elementary, these middle, these high school kids as well. So um, we took that approach, uh, and I think we've refined that very well, Bill, based on our experience with the summer camp extravaganza at the Test and Learn facility for the JTA. Mm -hmm. But then you, yeah. then, you, then you start to look at different levels, right? There's different tiers on how we communicate, right? Some folks are, are more strategic and thought and want to understand the big picture. Some want to understand, you know, fiscally, what does it cost? Um, what's my return on investment? Um, and then, of course, there's the tech folks like us that are super interested in the technology and really want to get into the weeds, right? Um, so I think we fine-tuned our craft, to say the least, and being able to communicate at all levels. Because to your question, Tabitha, it's super important, right? We've got to be able to communicate at all, all levels uh, to create a general understanding uh, of what we're trying to do here in public transit and kind of revolutionize the way we look at public, public transportation in general. I'll defer to Bill, but those are my thoughts. No, uh, I completely agree. And, uh, you know, you're, you're trying to communicate these, these thoughts and these concepts to, uh, you know, whether it be my four-year-old daughter or my 76-year-old mother, uh, you've got to somehow, you know, you know, meet that gap and fill that gap in. And one of the things that we've done to kind of solidify this effort is, is what we call the Ride and Learn program, which is, 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 is an official approach. It's a, it's a very methodical approach. It's, it's a very concentrated effort. It's not just, oh, you come in you know, for a tour and you do this. I mean, we've got 15 minute increments as far as what station you're gonna be at. We've got people on, on site. We had no one were doing the, uh, you know, the, the guided tours. We've got test dummies that we have the kids race. We've got surveys they fill out. I mean, it, it's very organized and controlled. And I, I say that because it's we don't we don't want to just throw a bunch of information. We want to make sure that we can feed them information. And then as we're providing information, we can see if their eyes glaze over. We can see if they get distracted. 
as Mike mentioned, the kids before all they wanted was Chick-fil-A. Like I knew I was going down the wrong path. So we've got it honed in that as we go, we can quickly pivot based on our audience, whether it be the council members, board of directors, or a group of six-year-olds. And you got to be dynamic and fluid. And by, by doing that, you can address what their interests are. Um, and you've got to be able to make those adjustments. But really, it's just being engaged and speaking to who your customer is. I think that goes with anything. It's look, you know, know who your customer is, speak to them and what their interests are. And that's, that's what we found to be our, 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 our best strength is that we've learned how to do that. Definitely. And, you know, Jacksonville and GTA has really been a leader in this space, I would say, as far as these projects go. So I'd mm -hmm. love to get your take on what are some first steps you might recommend to other transportation agencies who are looking to build out their own AV uh, technology mm -hmm. work? Mike, we can start with you there. Yeah, so I, I think the list is long, right? But I'll try to keep it concise. I think first and foremost, uh, it's you know risk tolerance. I think uh, organizations really have to understand that you, you we are now operating in a space where you will either become disrupted or you will be disruptor or disruptive in terms of forward leaning um, with allowing technology to enter your lifestyle, right? Allowing technology to enter into this digital ecosystem to which we all now operate today, right? So, so I would say um, that would be number one. I think second, secondly is, is understanding all the unique use cases where you can identify where you can inject this type of technology. We see autonomous vehicles providing a variety of different use cases across our footprint. We don't just look in isolation as Bill alluded to, to like, what is one particular use case? Obviously the U2C program is built kind of on the foundation of an objecting disruptive technology, right? But we also do things such as agile programs. We help folks solve complex transportation problems outside of the JTA um, with technology. A prime example of that is what we were able to do at Mayo Clinic. When the pandemic began um, last year, the initial pandemic, um, we decided we are not going to be passive. We are going to figure out a way to help the community. And one of the ways we were able to do that is within seven days, we had four autonomous vehicles operating on the Mayo campus in Jackson. And we were, we were a leader in this space and being able to transport product, i.e. Um, we were transporting uh, the test swabs from COVID-19 from the nurse's testing tent, which was roughly a half mile away from the laboratory. So instead of the the healthcare workers worrying about the logistics of moving a, a swab from one location to the other, we removed them from that a duty to allow them to focus on what was important, which was the patient. Thus, we came in and injected ourselves and leveraged technology to move product rather than people. Um, and it was super awesome. We, we, we transported, I think, over 35,000 samples with zero safety incidents under level four autonomy. So we actually removed the driver. So we look at, again, it goes back to Bill's point, kind of um, um, this holistic approach, but but those are my thoughts. So so don't think think outside the box, right? Don't think in isolation with regards to just transit, but how can you leverage this technology to do other things? I think third is you got to have a plan, right? You got to know the plan and nail the plan. So having a plan on, on how you're going to inject, you got to have not only a funding plan, how are you going to fund it? Typically it comes down to cost, right? In terms of the launching a pilot or some sort of deployment, um, be aggressive, be aware of what those funding opportunities are out there before you chase after them. Um, fail and fail fast um, and, and when it comes to those opportunities. Um, and then I think my, my, my last point of reference is you, you, when we look holistically at the long range transportation plan and, and it has become a point of emphasis in those plans to be sustainable, to be live this idea of corporate social responsibility, right? Transition from combustion or internal combustion engines or sources to some things that are less, you know, to reduce our overall carbon footprint, right? We look at electric vehicles. Um, so bring that into your world, right? Embrace it um, because it is coming. Uh, I'll leave you with that. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I don't really have much to add to that, Mike. Uh, you know, Mike said it, you got to have a bit of a risk tolerance. Uh, I don't think anyone would argue that, you know, me, Mike, and the team have a pretty high risk tolerance. But we've managed to mitigate that uh, by doing our research, by doing our planning. And as Mike said, just come up with a plan. And once you have some ideas, call us. I mean, I, I think that's the next step. Give us a call. Here at the JTA, we've, we've done it. Uh, you know, Mike's been leading the efforts on the RFP and I've been leading the efforts on the testing. Uh, we've got a great team in place. 
So there's no reason not to reach out and just give us a call and understand, you know, kind of where you're at and then where you're going and how do you get there? And it, there's a lot of steps that, that we've learned along the way. But as Mike said, you know, just think about where you want to do it, start coming with a plan, where your routes are, what, what's the problem you want to address, and then give us a call. Yeah, Bill, that is such a great point. And I'm really glad <laughs> you did that. Um, and because we involve ourselves in a lot of different communities of practice, right, with USDOT or what have you, mm -hmm. um, similar to that of PAVE. And, and we, have, we are not operating in this space where we do not want to share information, right? If we've made mistakes and we've made plenty of them um, along the way, right? Those, those mistakes sometimes, luckily for us, but sometimes those can be costly mistakes, right? Um, so we, we open the door to opportunity. We open the door, right, to share our experiences and help other folks navigate this complex environment. So you're exactly right, Bill. Thanks for mentioning that. Yeah. And design. That's really helpful. Thank you guys for kind of providing that next step for people who want to learn more. Mm -hmm. That's very beneficial. Um, I'd like to end on one kind of final question of why are you both personally passionate about AV technology? I love hearing people's stories of why, you know, this technology is something they're interested in and passionate about. And I would love to hear your take. Okay. Uh, I'll go first on this Bill, one. Bill, yeah. <laughs> um, my turn now. <laughs> so um, I've, uh, I've always been on the vehicle side in the automotive world. Uh, I was involved in electric car companies, you know, 10, 12 years ago on the design side and on the manufacturing side. So it was, uh, it was interesting to see how those companies were growing back then. And it's a similar, you know, it's a kind of a similar disruption where we got a lot of uh, opposition. Uh, we got a lot of aggression towards us as we, you know, as we tried to implement electric vehicles into the market, uh, a lot of doubt. Uh, very similar to, to what we're seeing in any type of new technology. There's the people that love it and there's the people that hate it. It tends to be very binary and very uh, polarizing. And it's exciting to be in that world to, to illuminate what, what it can do and what everyone else can do with it. So it's nice to also be on the customer side, kind of pulling this technology and using it instead of pushing it out to the market. Because it's, it's exciting to to be able to take it and be able to pull from a whole variety of different technologies and resources that are out there and different manufacturers and be able to test them and understand where their different use cases are. There's a variety of different autonomous companies uh, and each one kind of has its little niche. So it's, it's fun to almost work like it's a puzzle and see where you've got a problem and kind of where that vehicle fits in. So that's where I, I really get the passion from. So I, I feel lucky to be a part of this team and be able to come from the vehicle kind of manufacturing and design side, kind of the automobile world into the, the customer space and actually be able to implement this new technology. Not only does this roll, you know, roll in the electric vehicles that I've worked on in the past and that technology, but also the new technology for the autonomous uh, tech stacks that are being added onto it. So for me, it's just, you know, I'm an engineer. I like it. I like solving problems and I like seeing this technology and be able to play with it every day. It really is a lot of fun. And so that's where, that's where I get the passion from is, is being able to use this new technology that not everyone has access to. This is not a, you know readily accessible to be able to play with it like I do. Like I'm lucky that I can just get this and use it every day. So that's where my passion comes from, mostly just from an engineering and a technology side and be able to see where this technology can solve problems. That's really neat. Thanks for sharing. And Mike, yep. bring us home. Yeah, I think my passion comes from hearing Bill talk about his uh, his passions. Uh, but I <laughs> uh, couldn't agree with Bill anymore. Um, I, uh, and Bill could probably attest, I enjoy operating in a space that is very ambiguous. It's disruptive. The challenges that we are solving are our, our benchmarking, benchmarking challenges, right? And to be in the forefront of this disruption, as Bill mentioned, is just ex an exciting place to be, right? Um, it's very complex, it's a giant puzzle, um, and it's taking a step back and looking at it holistically, as Bill mentioned before. Um, so I enjoy and thrive, I believe, in operating in those type of environments. So I feel right at home in navigating um, this this path. So 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 that brings me that passion. I also, uh, in my previous life, to the JTA, spent a few years at uh, Amazon, studying Amazon, working in Amazon Robotics. Uh, so became very integrated in Amazon Robotics with inside fulfillment centers. 
Um, and then my prior life to that, I was in the military. So exposure to technology there was also, but it is, it is in our lives. It's a part of our lives, right? Um, and then I would say, secondly, what really makes me passionate, and Bill kind of alluded to this briefly with respect to test and learn, is we are in a position where we are kind of driving from a public entity uh, some of that research and development, right? Sometimes we look at things that, that and, and largely they are purely transactional, right? There are those transactional type relationships, um, but we've taken a very, very different approach when it comes with technology, our AV suppliers, our technology suppliers and said, hey, listen, these are the expectations of public transit, right? So I'm telling you what those are and you need to figure out a way to meet those requirements, but let's do this mm -hmm. together. So bridging and forging the gap between not only academia and industry, which is equally as important because we're, we're in that space as well, but also bridging the gap from private sector and industry to public sector and public government that are trying to play in this sandbox. So that integration, that cohesion, that collaboration, common goals and objectives is is really exciting. So that R&D component gets me super passionate. I don't know if you can tell that, but um, that that's the remarks I would leave you with there. Thank you. And, you know, we're lucky that we get to collaborate with you all. So thank you, Bill. Thank you, Mike, for taking the time to talk to us here at PAVE and sharing the insights into your work. Uh, we wish you the best of luck with all of your work and look forward to seeing the other incredible projects that come out of Jacksonville. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for having us.